John. The wall must not fall. Dread twisted in John's gut like a cold blade. If it does, all is lost. The men were assembled on the crest of a muddy hill, shrouded all around in a broom so thick they could scarcely see the tips of their own pikes. The ground beneath their feet was soft and slippery. If grass had ever grown here, it was gone now, long since grazed or trampled. In its place lay a bed of sludge, a mix of soil and clay and shit, rising to the men's ankles. Stay close, John yelled. He trotted along the line, sticky earth sucking at his mount's hooves with every step. They are upon us. The Golden Company's infantry had been divided into centuries, ten men across and ten ranks deep, with each square commanded by a captain or a sergeant. Fifty such squares stood side by side, five thousand strong together, and they would hold their ground as one. Westerosi saw footmen as a mere complement to cavalry, rabble for mounted knights to cut down as they galloped past. But across the narrow sea, the free companies knew better. Pretend you got no cocks, Franklin Flowers bellowed to his own pike square. Today we fight like them pointy-hatted eunuchs. No, not like the unsullied. Better. In truth, an old commander from the company of the Cat had developed this strategy of the square, taking his inspiration from Astapor's slave soldiers. This had been before John's time with Blackheart, back in the trying old days when the Golden Company was led by Utherides Peak. That Captain General had signed a contract with Tyrosh, and marched to meet its enemies on the shore of Vess Lake, where the Cat's pikemen were waiting for him. The foes had laid down their shields to wield spears twenty feet long, so that rank upon rank could support their front. Only the most disciplined riders would have charged into those thousands of deadly points. The Golden Company never lacked discipline, and had suffered all the more for it. The squares of the cats had held against their assault. Red ripples on the lake was the bitter song the survivors sang. Those singers were gone now. Their contracts ended, if not their lives, but their song lingered at the campfires, and the Golden Company still trained in the square. What they shed in blood, we gained in wisdom. The thought made John both sad and proud at once. He opened and closed a mailed fist. The company remembers. All fifty centuries faced south, into the screams that rose out of the mists below. Snarls, moans, and shrieks filled the gray, as if from the throats of rabid hellhounds, an inhuman chorus of panic and suffering. The poor beasts. They'll be put out of their misery soon enough. In the winter's broom, John Connington saw none of them, only a thousand points of flame dancing and writhing like so many fireflies. Sir Tormund, Lord John yelled, it is time. Tell your brother to begin. The knight nodded, and without a word, galloped down the hill toward the muffled cries of their bait. In less than a minute, he'd vanished into the fog. One minute more, and the company's trumpets blared. Da! 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 A few soldiers winced at the deafening sound, but John nodded his approval. The horns made him think of homeless Harry Strickland, and he prayed the captain would keep his prince safe. Blast came a second time, then a third, yet there was no reply from across the field. Where are you, cuz? The rising sun to the east was as hidden as their foes there, though dawn had lightened the gloom to a paler shade of gray. Behind the great curtain of fog lay five thousand Tyrell riders. They'd rode through the night, snaking their way down the king's road like some nocturnal monster, hungry for glory. Unless the scouts were wrong. They might be wrong. Red Ronnet could have waited for the infantry after all. The trumpets called out a fourth time. His men glanced uneasily about, catching the eyes of their comrades beside them. A fifth time. John's hand itched beneath the gauntlet. Do they suspect something? A sixth. They could be behind us. A seventh. Others take them all. Finally... The Tyrell trumpets answered. Da-da, 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 da-da. 
At that sound, enormous fireballs flew from the south to the east, one after another. When there was no trumpet blast to drown them out, the mangonels sounded with hideous snaps, like the breaking of giant's bones. In the distance, the burning pots they'd thrown shattered. Their flames burst forth for an instant, then disappeared. Impressive as it looked, the spectacle was but a Carthine fire mage show. The pitch most like fell short and hit no one. But that hadn't been its purpose. Siege engines were seldom used in pitched battles. They were too slow to reload, not worth the men they took to operate, and far too difficult to defend. A tempting weakness. The lowest plum gets the first plucking. John Connington reared his horse. Still as stone, he shouted. Fifty feet to his right, Sir Franklin echoed him. To his left, Little Pussy did the same. Beyond them yelled Will Cole and Laura Miss Mud, then Two Swords and Percy and Ball, and so on down the line. The men stiffened and stood frozen. They had to stay hidden in the fog till the last. The smallest motion might uncloak them. The Golden Company's trumpets fell silent, while Tyrell's grew louder. Da 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 da. They called out war, but still John waited. Out of the corner of his eye, Griff thought he glimpsed some movement. He turned and squinted up at the drum tower, but other than the brazier on the ramparts, there was nothing to see. Within the walls of Storm's End, Sir Dennis Strong had his own role, as the rest of the company had theirs without. If it goes to plan, he'll want a lordship, Connington knew. Perhaps Harrenhal. Harren's curse was more than a fair price to pay for Durin's stronghold, he supposed. John had known the Castellan's father long ago. Lord Faring was an insufferable braggart, but fiercely loyal, and a man of his word. Connington would extend to the son a good marriage, a lordship even. Mayhaps the man will come over, Halden had said as he'd prepared the letters. Griff figured otherwise. Sheep keep with their flock. Not so with Lord Connington or Prince Rhaegar, maybe, but with ordinary men. But if Sir Gilbert had more honor than wits, his seneschal was another sort of man entirely. Lord Elwood Meadows had already betrayed and murdered Courtney Penrose, it was said. An overripe peach without a stone, that one. He will make a good ally. For the nonce. In another life, John Connington had oft been a guest at Storm's End, suffering through its feasts and tourneys. The castle's tender-hearted maester had found him once, wandering the halls to avoid Lord Stephen's hulking sons, and taken him up to the rookery to see his proud flock. He had burned to think that Crescent pitied him. If Dennis's treating went poorly, those birds would be the fallback. Three hundred distractions would fill the air along with the trumpets. The guards would be tired, he knew, emaciated, unprepared for the fury a man of the company could bring. Griff had wanted to give the roost's maester chain to Sir Duncan, who seemed the shrewder of the two brothers, closer resembling a true man of the citadel. That had not sat well with Dennis. What if the wretched knight won't come to the rookery? He had protested. It's a floor down to the lord's chambers, and I'm twice the squirrel Duncan is. To prove his boast, he'd raced his brother up the smoothest wall of Griffin's Roost and down again. It was an easy choice after that. Still, Sir Dennis might fail. Might have already failed. If so, Sir Gilbert held the heir to Dorne as his hostage. A disappointment, but not the worst result. After all, the Dorners sought something Lord John could not give. They want our prince to marry their princess, Sir Franklin had put it. And if John could not seal an alliance with Dorne, neither could King Tommen, so long as Stannis' men held Arion. The spearmen in the Boneway might not join Prince Aegon, but so long as they could not join the Lannisters, the Golden Company's flank was safe. As for Stannis, let him make of Dorne what he can from across the realm. Da 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 da! The Tyrell trumpets called again, louder this time. Connington straightened in his saddle, his good hand clenching the hilt of his sword. The earth shook. The broom stirred. Then the shadows of horsemen drifted into view.
still half concealed by the fog. There were thousands of them, a long column of gray wraiths racing ahead, coaching death beneath their arms. The sound of their hoofbeats rose in crescendo. Connington held his breath. They cannot see us, he told himself. Turn, John prayed to the warrior. Turn, John prayed to the father. He could see the points of their lances now, piercing through the haze, and banners of a thousand colors, each muted by the mist they moved through. The deep red of House Bulwer, the green apple of New Barrel, Lord Caswell's yellow centaur. All of the might of the Reach charged towards John Connington, and for a moment, he feared he had been wrong about everything. The battle formation, the mangonels, the beasts, the burning faggots, it all came rushing at him. The letters and the lies, Red Ronnet's anguish and his fury, the trumpets, Homeless Harry, the cliff, the broom, the valor of the company he led, the long reign of his son. Would he die upon this hill, an exile and a fraud? What bitter song would he become? Turn, John prayed to the stranger. They turned. The riders flowed like a raging river to the south, toward the flailing torches. Soon came the sound of lances striking flesh. Piercing cries rose from below. An oryx, a donkey, some oxen. Soon hundreds of animals called out from the fog, shrieking, dying. As they fell to the damp earth, their flames went out one by one. The horsemen brought with them a gust of wind, lifting some of the fog's tendrils to reveal the bare field below. Connington got a better look now at the Tyrell cavalry, even as their formation broke. Some riders shook their heavy lances free of the carcasses. Others wheeled around, searching for anything with two legs to kill, but finding no one. Peek's men had long since retreated. Beneath a green and gold banner, a knight in a winged great helm glowered at a dying ox, the torch bound to its horn still burning. His mud-splattered breastplate bore dancing griffins. The knight barked a command and trumpets called a retreat. Da-da-da, da-da-da, da-da-da! But John Connington would not let them escape. Bollock, now, he ordered. Notch, draw, screamed the Summer Islander in answer. Loose! Six hundred bowstrings thrummed like a single giant harp. Their song shot arrows through the air, skimming down the hill to fall on the cavalry below. The missiles drummed upon their heavy plate. Amongst the din and clangor, men and horse cried alike in unearthly harmony. That is but your first taste, Griff thought. He forced a smile. The griffin knight bellowed, gesturing up the hill. Again a trumpet voiced his will, ordering the Tyrell riders to charge once more. Da-da, 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 da-da! The horsemen turned north and began the climb. Spread out, they lacked a true vanguard, but they ascended with daunting speed. Too fast, John thought. Despite the mushy earth, the Tyrell horses kept their footing, and they bound upward, spraying mud in all directions. They are close enough to see us now. He looked to his men. Ready, pikes! The front rank knelt as the pikes behind them pushed forward like the bristling quills of a giant porcupine. They mustn't break. Beneath the gold! Connington cried out with all his breath. The, the bitter steel! A thousand men roared in unison. The pikes will spook the horses. The foe is too disorganized. In a moment, they'll turn about. No horse would keep charging. John Connington was wrong. Horse met Pike with the sound of a hundred long, bestial screams melting into one. Rows of men flew backward as their pikes snapped. A storm of red rain cascaded over the company. The rear infantry grunted under the pressing weight of their comrades. But the wall held and pushed forward through the mud. The weaponless scurried to the rear as fresh pikemen took their place, stepping over the dead, angling their weapons up over the fallen destriers. Unhorsed Tyrell riders, caked in mud, drew their swords and rushed in low, knocking their pikes aside. Find a face, Black Bollock commanded. His archers ran up and took aim between the squares. Loose! Arrows battered the knights, piercing through eyes and brain, but over the dead rose another wave of cavalry. The bowmen retreated as quickly as they'd come, and the wall of pikes remade itself. Tyrell knights reared their mounts and thrust their lances towards the front rank, but their reach was far too short. John made a quick count of the pike square before him. The sentry had shed twenty men, maybe twenty-one. 
The wall must not fall. Beneath the gold, he called again. The, the bitter steel. The tangle of bodies thundered, earth churning beneath them. Connington saw a charging courser shy away from the pike wall, whilst other mounts reared and balked. Ride down, shouted a knight. Down and around, encircle them. The knights wheeled around, descending the hill as another volley of arrows pelted them. Hundreds rode east in search of a flank, hundreds west, but most sat idle, shields high, unsure which way to go. Still, a horn beckoned them to charge, brazen, as if it could bring down this wall before them by itself. Da 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 da! Stop! Another knight screamed. Not west, it's a fucking cliff! The column reared, turned about, rode east. Then, from the king's road, new trumpets blared, sharp and angry. Aurora! 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 All heads turned, and Lord John could almost hear his enemy's thoughts. Not trumpets. Too loud for trumpets. Too strident. Too... alive. When the Golden Company crossed the narrow sea, only half the fleet had arrived near the landing site on Cape Wrath. He'd known the other half would turn up. The uncertainties were when and where. Many had been blown south to Estermont, a few even as far as the Weeping Town. It stood to reason that others would land farther north. Sure enough, on the second day of winter, a raven from Tarth had reached Griffin's Roost. Homeless Harry had been giddy at the news. Good, good, he said as he paced the room. Though the trumpeters are with us, and it's the horns that make them good and angry. But none of those bouncy charge songs, no. They have to sound like them when they quarrel. Short blasts are what we need, as loud as possible. Bold. John Connington had examined the map, looking for where Sir Humphrey Stone could land with his forces. A lit candle had been placed atop Storm's End as their planning began, to keep the parchment from moving. Then, Valentine Honors, skull side up, had been set down to represent the company's forces, with Westerosi stags for the Tyrells, and stars for the beasts of burden. The silver lying on the map could have paid out attorney's prize. Can they augment our cavalry? asked John. Augment? You want our riders skewered? These bulls are smart, real smart, but they don't know friend from foe. That or they don't give a fig. Harry chuckled. No, this isn't Sivas. What they do is drive fear so far into a man's gut that his bowel empties all over his panicked mount. Havoc is their game, John. They're giant imps. Connington opened and closed his right hand. Here, he tapped a spot on the map. The southern part of the Kingswood will give them cover. We will smash the Tyrell horsemen between hammer and anvil. Homeless Harry shook his head. You still don't understand. It's only hammer. Lord John looked to Harry, then back to the map. With his good hand, he swept all the coins off the Stormlands. They would need to begin again. The map was not the land, that much he knew. This isn't a Sivas board either. That game has rules. There is one more thing, Homeless Harry had said that night. I know you don't want the company befuddled, but these boys are different. They need wine. Aurora! 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 Horses wickered on the field below as the earth trembled beneath their feet. Some knights stopped and pointed. Others turned and put the spurs to their mounts. The griffin knight removed his helmet and gaped. From the mists emerged a shuddering wall of great gray shades, bowling over horse and rider both. Half again as tall as the Tyrell cavalry, the herd blundered drunkenly forward and trampled everything in its path. Great arms swung back and forth like the clappers of giant bells, knocking men off their mounts with each toll. Ivory tusks gored the unlucky flesh they found and then ripped themselves free. There were three score of them, charging faster than Connington would have thought possible, well beyond the speed of a horse's canter. Blood ran from the elephant's legs. They had been cut before their charge to raise their ire all the more. It was a wonder they could be controlled at all. Yet each creature did have a driver seated on its thick neck. In the lead was Humphrey Stone, his mount's tusks covered in a layer of bronze, 
its giant ears flapping forward and back, billowing like war banners. Behind Sir Humphrey, in the center of the pack, was the largest of the herd, an enormous thing that might as well have been a bald mammoth. It was the calmest of the bulls, as well as the largest, sober, its legs bloodless, but still a dire sight to behold. Its tusks were sharpened to a point and painted the color of blood. On its face was a giant chamfron. The ornate metalwork was cohoric if Lord John had to guess. What was not clad in armor was covered in a layer of wet charcoal, giving the monster the look of polished jet. The Black Dread. The great elephant was draped in a giant sheet bearing the red, three-headed dragon of House Targaryen. Straddling its neck was Malo Jane by the look of his breastplate, though the sergeant's face was covered by a helm shaped like a dragon's head. Behind him was a wooden tower painted red and affixed to a giant saddle of twisted dark steel and leather, decorated with old Valyrian runes. Within it stood homeless Harry Strickland, clutching a spear topped with the golden skull of bitter steel. Beside the two grinning captains general was Sir Raleigh Duckfield, wrapped in his snow-white cloak, and in front of them stood his son, our son. Aegon Targaryen shone like the sunrise, all the more for being donned in black. His armor was as dark and heavy as midnight. It made him look almost brawny. He wore no helmet, a reckless choice, but the better to show his silver hair. That is a king. How could anyone deny it? And there, raised above his head, was... Cunnington could scarce believe it. Agor Rivers had owned three treasures, all three lost thanks to Bloodraven's treachery. With all his wealth, could the fat men have found them? Horses fled in every direction, ignoring their riders' commands. Some tumbled over or bucked their riders, leaving them mired in the mud before the charging drunken monsters. Others rode back up the hill towards the waiting pikemen, but most of the cavalry fled west, or south, into the gloom. There, in the winter's broom, amongst a thousand horses, the griffin knight took flight. His red hair streamed behind him as he crossed the edge of nothingness to meet what lay beyond. John found himself nodding. Beneath his helmet, a salty droplet ran into his mouth. Sweat, he told himself. He scanned the battlefield. Thousands of Tyrell riders still remained, but they were scattered, broken, leaderless. Already some were yielding. The Golden Company's cavalry had swung to the east by now. The pikemen remained to their north. There was no escape for their foe, he knew. The rest would be mere slaughter. John Connington let his right gauntlet drop to the earth. Charge!